Hi there and welcome to the second Foundation Years webinar hosted by the National Children's Bureau. If you can see the Early Years and Qualifications front screen um, and if you can hear me then you're logged in and everything should be working for you. Um, what we're going to do is um, I can see how many people have logged in and I can see that that number is going up gradually but that there are still a few people left to log in. So I'm going to give it a couple of minutes um, before we officially start this webinar. Hi there, and if you've just logged in, uh, welcome to the Early Years Workforce and Qualifications webinar um, hosted by National Children's Bureau. Um, we are going to give people a few more moments to log in, and then we'll be starting the webinar. Thank you. Hello and welcome if you've just joined us. Um, you are in the right place for the Early Years Workforce and Qualifications webinar. We, were, we will be uh, beginning the webinar in a couple of uh, minutes. We are just waiting for a few more of the audience to log in and then we'll get started. Right, let's let's get started. Okay, good afternoon. Thank you for thank you for logging in to this webinar. Um, you are logged into the Early Years Workforce and Qualifications webinar, um, hosted by National Children's Bureau, but um, led by Ian Ward from the Department for Education. Just to introduce myself, I am Ellie Sargate Francis. I'm from the Early Childhood Unit at the National Children's Bureau and I'm going to be sharing this webinar today. Uh, we're going to start with a very brief introduction to the Foundation Years program from myself. Um, we will then be handing over to Ian um, to tell us about Early Years Workforce and Qualifications. And there will be opportunities for questions. There'll be opportunities for questions midway and at the end. If you are new to webinars, um, if you look at your sidebar, uh, you should see uh, a link for questions and that's where you type in your questions to us. Um, if you type in a question, please do give your name and maybe your setting name. because It's really nice to personalize those questions and please do um, email questions. Nothing, nothing, um, you know, no question too, too silly linked to early years workforce and qualifications. We really want everyone to come, come away with a clear picture. Um, so, and the more people who do email in questions, the more interactive it is and the more positive the webinar will be. So um, just to say opportunity for questions midway and at the end. We do have over 300 people booked to be part of this webinar today. Obviously, if everybody asks a question, I'm afraid we won't be able to put all of those questions to Ian today. But we will try to theme those questions and get the most relevant ones over to Ian. 
Um, we will then uh, be finalising the webinar with just a bit of information about things that you may be able to take part in in the future through the foundation years. Okay, so at NCB we are the early years stakeholder engagement partner with the Department of Education. Um, what, are, what are the aims of that contract? Well, the aims are to improve practitioner knowledge and understanding, improve the confidence of early years settings, and facilitate a healthy debate between the Department for Education and the early years sector. Um, but how do we do that? Well, we do that predominantly through um, things like this. So we have the Foundation Years website, which is used by over 57,000 individuals a month. We have our monthly Foundation Years newsletter, which goes out to over 27,000 subscribers a month. And we also have webinars throughout the year, and I'll give some details of our uh, further webinar planned for before Christmas at the end of uh, the webinar today. And we do also have opportunities for you to meet regionally with the Department for Education. Um, and those are our Learn, Explore, Debate events, um, which we have some planned for early 2020. So that's just a brief overview of the um, Foundation Years contract and NCB's role. So what we're going to do now is we're going to hand over to Ian Ward. We're really pleased to have Ian Ward with us today to tell us about Early Years Workforce and qualifications. So Ian, when you're ready, please do make a start. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Ian Ward. I work in the Department for Education, um, as Ali said earlier, and I have a particular responsibility for the qualifications requirements and the early years workforce. Um, what I'm going to try and cover today um, are things that we get asked on a regular basis by people in the sector. Um, and I believe you'll have access to the slides after the event, so um, hopefully a lot of the information that I give you today um, will help you going forward um, to, to, to ide identify the qualification requirements for the early years sector, but also um, some additional information on funding um, and how you can find out which qualifications are accepted, for example. So the Requirements for the workforce um, are set down in our early years uh, framework, and that's the statutory framework for the early years foundation stage. Um, there are two sections to that, the first being the safeguarding and welfare requirements, um, and that covers all the steps that providers must take to keep children safe, but it also covers the staff to child ratios and the staff qualifications, and that's the the part of the framework that governs my work um, and the part that I work to in terms of developing qualifications. So in the EYFS, as I mentioned, it sets down the early years uh, requirements for staff ratios. And those, broadly speaking, are for under twos, one member of staff for three children two-year-olds, one for four children, and three and four-year-olds, one member of staff for eight children. There is a, an additional uh, ratio that you can use if you've got a qualified teacher or early years te someone with early years teacher status of one to 13. But those are the, the core staff ratios that underpin everything that we do. I'm just trying to find how back how to reverse the slides. Uh, there we go. Okay. So the, start, the qualification requirements is the thing that um, myself and my team get the largest number of qualification uh, questions about and inquiries about. Um, and I think that that's understandable as as there have been a number of different requirements over the years. Um, I just noticed the slides have stopped, Ellie. Is there anything? Hi there, Ian. We've just noticed that too. Bear with us one second. Apologies, everyone. <laughs> there we go. Can you see that there, Ian? Uh, I can see it, yeah. Thank you very much. And just okay, check that. Is that okay? Go for it, Ian. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. That's okay. 
The, as I say, the qualification requirements are the thing that we get the largest number of inquiries about. And I was about to say that that's understandable because the requirements have changed over the years. Um, and we appreciate that that sometimes makes it more difficult to identify qualifications. But hopefully I'll be able to show you today um, that it's actually relatively easy once you know where to look. <laughs> OK, so in most early year settings, the manager must hold at least a DFE approved level three qualification. Um, I've used the term DFE approved, which actually refers to something that most people probably know as full and relevant. Um, we're trying to move away from the full and relevant uh, wording just, just because it's not terribly helpful to people when they're coming into the sector to understand. Um, so I'll, for the purposes of today, certainly I will use DFE approved. Um, half of the other staff must hold, again, a DFE approved level two qualification um, and the remaining staff can be unqualified. And just to flag up that currently within the EYFS, there is no requirement for graduates in early year settings, although we do, we do have uh, graduate qualifications and status, which I'll mention later on. So, to count in the ratios at level three, um, something that people get confused about sometimes is the English and maths qualifications. It's actually suitable level two qualifications that we require these days, not, not just GCSEs. Um, that was changed some time ago, um, but we do still get asked about that. Um, just to clarify, it's level two qualifications in English and maths, and that can include GCSEs, but it doesn't have to be GCSEs. So there are a number of different types of qualifications available. Um, we've heard in the past about NVQs. Um, we don't use that term currently, but we have vocational qualifications, which are very similar in, in style and, and content. And we have standalone qualifications, which are just purely the qualification on its own, usually delivered by a college or a training provider. Um, and nearly always a mix of classroom and work placement training and assessment. But we also have apprenticeships and that's a, a growing area for most sectors. Um, and I'll go into more detail about what apprenticeships are shortly, um, but simply put, they are jobs with training um, and a, a package of training that supports the, the learner to achieve the correct standard. So. We work very closely with the awarding organisations that develop qualifications um, and, and the departments within DFE that work on apprenticeships too. Um, and I'll explain how we decide on um, the content of qualifications now. In order to ensure that the, the qualifications we approve contain the right mix of skills, knowledge and understanding um, that people need to be able to do their job um, effectively. We actually create what are known as criteria um, and there are two sets of criteria currently, some for level three and some for level two. Um, and in order to set those criteria, we work with usually an expert reference group from the sector um, and then we will go out to public consultation on the content of those criteria so that we can be sure that they actually reflect the job role that they're intended to uh, qualify someone to do. It's quite a lengthy process. It takes generally up to a year to, uh, to develop a set of criteria. Um, so it's something we take very, very seriously in getting the, the content right. And then the awarding organisations such as City and Gills and Cash, um, OCR, people like that take the, the criteria away and they set the learning outcomes and, and the assessment requirements to create their qualifications. They then bring them back to, uh, to the DFE and we, once we've checked that they meet the requirements, we, uh, we sign them off and approve them and they're added to our qualifications list, which is on the .gov.uk website.
which is the the part of the uh, discussion today I think that people will um, have asked questions about in the past I'm sure um, our qualifications list is designed to give access to people so that they can find out for themselves which qualifications are approved by the department um, and we've actually we now provide the lists in um, spreadsheets that can be sorted and filtered on that website uh, we we had a a searchable uh, website previously but we found uh, when I took over the job we found that there are a number of glitches in that and uh, depending on what words you put you could get different results which was a bit unfortunate so going forward we we've actually created spreadsheets that you can sort um, and as I mentioned earlier because of the changes to the qualifications criteria over the years um, the, the level three criteria that we currently have were put in place in 2014 um, and we've just had new level twos which started this September so there are different lists depending on when the qualification was taken for level three there's a, a pre-September 14 list as well as a, a current list um, so you will need to know uh, um, from the individual who you're intending to employ or you're promoting within your organisation when they started their qualification and when it was certificated. Um, that will help. So the spreadsheets when you open them up um, this this one I've put onto the slide I'm sorry it's a bit small I hope you can sort of vaguely read it um, the spreadsheets include um, the qualification level the name of the qualification the awarding organization and in column D whether it is actually being deemed to be full and relevant and in column E is, a, is an important column with any additional notes, um, which I'll explain shortly. Um, so you can actually sort for the level of the qualification. If you click on uh, the drop down on the, the, the qualification heading, it, it will actually give the option of the levels and you can actually just click on say three and it will only give you the level three qualifications for example and then you can actually go through and sort that by awarding organization but to to start the process really you you need i would suggest to have a copy or the original if, if possible of the qualification certificate from the individual so that you know exactly the wording on that qualification certificate sometimes sometimes people remember the titles of their their qualification slightly differently to their the way they actually put onto the certificate so and that does make a difference to trying to find a qualification so that's the sort of first first thing to look at um, you can then, as I say, filter through for the qualification level, the awarding organization title. I would also suggest in awarding organization title, you, you click um, various as well as the name of the individual awarding organization, because there are a number of qualifications, such as the old level three diploma, which actually was the same structure and, and content for a number of awarding organizations so it is the it's the title and then it will say various in awarding organizations so that's that's a handy tip for for finding ones that that get caught under that heading if the um if it says full and relevant yes in column d then it's advisable also to check the column E because there are some qualifications that although they're deemed full and relevant they're only full and relevant if certain things have happened and that usually is if they've got assessed practice in the workplace which you would need to check before you uh, can be confident. So there's a few handy tips which I've put onto this slide here which I'm going to whiz past because it will be there available for you. The uh, cause list also has um, a range of information on other things. It's the paediatric first aid, literacy numeracy requirements, which I mentioned previously, what to do if somebody comes with an overseas qualification. Um, and uh, there are a range of other bits of information on there which are, are useful 
um, and if you click on the headings on on the uh, course list page you'll get straight to the specific information under these headings okay I said I would talk briefly about apprenticeships as I say they are jobs with training um, they are more common these days um, because people are very familiar with this style of training um, and it gives people it gives particularly employers a chance to actually be much more hands-on in the training that their uh, members of staff receive they're very it's very based on employer and training provider working together and then in some ways that's the secret of its success uh, we've currently got apprenticeships at levels two and level three um, the level two takes about 12 months to, to complete and the level three is between 18 months and two years generally speaking just to say that somebody who's successfully completed an apprenticeship at level two will meet the level two ratio requirements um, it is approved by us as full and relevant or DFE approved and level three the same story if you've got an apprenticeship successfully completed at level three you can count in the uh, level three ratios the reason for that is that we work with people who develop the apprenticeships and make sure that they cover all of our criteria within the apprenticeship so it is absolutely full and relevant and, and DFE approved. We get quite a number of questions about paediatric first aid um, because the requirements changed a couple of years ago. Um, and as it says on the slide here, newly qualified staff with level two or three early years qualifications um, that was actually awarded after the uh, end of June 2016 must either have a full paediatric first aid or an emergency PFA certificate uh, within three months from starting work. I mean, clearly, um, this is a very important aspect. Um, and there are a number of uh, reasons why this was was implemented um, at the time and one of the things that you might be familiar with is the Millie's mark that arose around that time as well which gives um, employers a chance to actually get a quality mark uh, where you've got all of your staff appropriately trained in paediatric first aid if you have um, any help need any help with finding the qualifications um, or confirming some qualifications uh, are approved by us you can use the the contact us form um, on the .gov uh, UK website um, this is really for use if you can't find it on on the lists it's not it's not a service for um, getting written confirmation for things that are already on the list to be fair um, because actually you what we would recommend people to do is when you find it on the list if you take a screenshot on your computer and save that that will be sufficient um, for anybody um, who needs to check that for you and for example inspectors coming in Ofsted inspectors will have access to this list too um, so they can confirm it that way um, you don't need a written letter specifically from from us in in a situation where you found it on the website there are occasions where qualifications from the past haven't uh, made it onto our, our list probably usually because um, the awarding organization hasn't submitted it for approval but um, so there will be some times when you might want to just just get confirmation from us and we're more than happy to do that with things that that are not on the list or if you're struggling with the list we can sometimes give you a hand okay so I'm going to pause there and take some questions um, I think William probably support yes. thank you yes thank you Ian we have had a few questions through. Some of them are quite cool. technical. Um, yeah, I was thinking that. about the specific uh, scenarios. Right. Um, I think you answered this, but maybe you can clarify. So Susan Swan has said she has, if you have a qualified teacher, a level three early years educator, a level two staff member, member, and an apprentice working towards their level two, does that apprentice count in the ratios? 
the apprentice the apprentice can count in the ratios once they've achieved their apprenticeship yeah um, now it depends this is where as you say it's going to get slightly technical in the old framework for level two there is actually a specific level two qualification in, in required so it is possible that your apprentice could complete their level two qualification before they finish the whole apprenticeship and if they've completed the qualification successfully and got their certificate then yes they can count uh, okay but, but otherwise yeah. they they will only count in the ratios once they've achieved the, the full apprenticeship i think that's really clear thanks ian Good. okay wendy oppenden has given us a couple of questions one of them is um can level two be o levels i i think we're talking about the math um here um and this is for those of us who have who are older than having gcses who <laughs> o levels count <laughs> that includes me and yes they do count yes they are they will be replaced by GCSEs but they're essentially the same thing yeah and Wendy also has another question about the early years qualification list and that's that is the 24 sorry the 2014 date referenced in the EYQL referring to when they started or when they completed their qualification it's when they started actually which is not always the easiest thing to prove when people have been out of the, the workforce for a while for example um, but it is when they started because it, it, it was only fair at, at September the 1st 2014 if somebody was already on a qualification to allow them to finish it and still count in the ratios so yes it's when they started that qualification brilliant the okay. awarding, sorry, just to clarify, the awarding organisation, if necessary, will be able to probably give you the date they registered and that's the date you should take it from. Brilliant. Um, okay, uh, the questions are coming in. So, G Spitzer, who is an early years coordinator, has said, I have a level five qualification and I'm seeking to gain a level six or BA degree. I had heard there is a possibility of having an apprenticeship for this level. Is this going to happen? And if so, when will it start? <laughs> you're stealing my you're stealing my thunder. That's in my next part. <laughs> the, Let's the, leave it to the, them. the intention is that they will be a level five and six, and I, I'll cover that shortly. Brilliant. Um, oh, so yeah, so this is a this is again a clarification, but it's clearly something that people um, are concerned or have questions about. So Kelly Mealy has just said, so, so apprenticeships can't be used in ratios. I think you've answered it. They can't be unless they've passed their apprenticeship. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Um, or one about funding for um, training. So uh, again, you may be coming to this, but will there be new funding to support existing early years staff to do level three and above? That's from Rachel Watson. I, I will be covering funding, yes. Uh, I can't really answer the second part of the question. Um, as you, you guess, you know, sort of going where we are politically at the moment. Um, there okay. currently aren't any plans that in my work. No, but, no plans. Yeah, no plans. Currently. Okay, I think that answers the question. Thank you. Um, they're coming in. One second, we're just dribbling them down. Okay. <laughs> Ah, so this is about, um, this is again about levels and ratios and qualifications. If a daycare setting has three rooms, do that, does there need to be a level three in every room? That's from Kelly. The, um, the requirements don't require it in every room actually, but within the EYFS there's some uh, wording which I, God just got out of my head now, but it's about there being the children being within sight and sound of the of the manager, um, yeah, that or the person responsible. So uh, it, it, there isn't a specific requirement for a room manager at level three. It, you know, I would suggest it's probably good practice if it works for the setting, um, but you know that those are not the requirements in the EYFS. Okay then. And this again, I think it's a clarification point, but I suppose people are really wanting to be clear on this. So you can have unqualified staff, 50% can be unqualified. That's from Laura. 
Yeah, that's correct. It's correct. Yes. I mean, we we would hope that they, you know, obviously they would have induction and, and support to, to develop themselves. And we would hope that a, a good number of those would want to progress onto a level two, for example, or higher. Um, but yes, you can have unqualified staff. Okay. Um, so Susan Swan, uh, actually I think Susan had already asked one question, has, has kind of queried how it works employing apprenticeship, apprenticeship if um, they don't count in the ratios. Um, I mean, that's not a specific kind of um, question. I, I think that's specific to the setting. But um, do, you have a, do you have anything further you'd like to say about the benefits of em employing apprenticeship um, within settings? Well, I think one of the, the strongest things to, in my mind is one that they're already employed with you, so that if you've got a you know a relationship, a good strong relationship there. But I, as I said earlier, I think that the strength from my point of view, is apart from it being very robust training that's been um, developed to meet the criteria that we set with with people in the sector who who know the job so well um, is that the employer can be really really hands-on and, and supporting the training and knowing what the training is that that person is getting um, mm -hmm. to a certain extent you, you can train them to meet your needs as well although they will cover everything that somebody should be able to do um, yeah the, the other thing which I will come on to later is the funding uh, position for that because actually it's, it's, it's strong for a good number of employers it's a really worthwhile thing but I will cover that shortly. Okay, I think we do have a bit more time if that's okay for a few more questions, Ian. Is that yeah, all right? Absolutely. Yes, <laughs> we're firing them at you now. <laughs> um, Ian, will the EYFS reforms have any impact on the current ratios? Not that I'm aware of. No, there, there's certainly no, no plans to change the ratios in my not to my knowledge. It's not. It's not been in, in anything I've seen either. Okay, so it seems like a no. And are there separate safeguarding training requirements like there are for first aid? Or is the safeguarding content in the level two and level three courses sufficient? It, it should be sufficient um, within the level two and level three, certainly. Yes, we don't set a separate um, qualification requirement for that. Uh, I know I know that some providers do do their own training, it depends on the size of the, the organisation, but some providers do. Um, have their own courses to meet, I suppose, their own policy statements, um, but there's no specific qualification requirement. Okay. Um, in a mixed um, age group setting, for example, a childminder, how do you work out the ratios? <laughs> I don't think that's something I can answer in, in okay. sort of in this one without having detail of the of the actual organisation. If you see what I mean, um, right. You would need to, you would need to staff in in very simple terms. You would need to staff to the lowest age range requirement. I guess would be a quick way of saying it. So if you've got two year olds, you would need to staff to that requirement. Right. Um, yes. Okay. So your lowest, you need to start to yeah, the lowest the age. Young, the youngest age, that would be my suggestion. Okay. Um, we've had a question about funding, but I think you're going to be answering that, Ian. Um, okay. A few more questions are coming in. This is more, well, this is more of a comment. Um, Please make or a request. Please make the qualifications. Sorry, this is from Roslyn. Please make the qualifications easy to navigate and use. The new diploma level two is is in order. Thanks, but the language is difficult to follow for the students. So that's a, that's a comment from Roslyn. <laughs> Right, okay. I'm, I'm not sure whether that refers to our criteria or the qualification itself, but we'll leave it at that, shall we? <laughs> okay. okay. Um, I think we probably um, should move on. What we will do is questions are coming through. We're, we're scribing them down as, as we speak, but um, it's okay. taken a little time. So what we could do is we'll try to take some of the questions that are coming through quickly now and uh, look at them again at the final um, question opportunity. How does that sound? That sounds yeah. good to me. 
Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so we'll hand back over to you, Ian, for the rest of your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I've touched on a couple of things, I think, um, earlier on, but there are a number of things that have, are new or are upcoming, um, and I thought it might be good to give you um, a bit of knowledge on some and heads up on the others, I guess, is what I'm saying. Um, so, the first, which I have mentioned, um, is the level two qualifications. Now. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the change, but just so that you know, um, last year we developed a new set of criteria, as I say, through um, working with an expert reference group, and we consulted on the criteria. And the awarding organisations have now developed their new qualifications. Um, and anyone entering the workforce um, with and taking a new qualification for, from the 1st of September this year will be required to have one of these new level twos. Um, there's a new list on our quals list of, of the ones that we have approved to date um, and we have got more coming through gradually over time so we will we'll add those to the list as they as they come through. What I want to, did want to stress was that though so that doesn't affect people who were already qualified with the DFE approved qualification before that date. Anybody who had already got their qualification and is counting in your ratios can continue to do so. They don't need to go and redo a qualification. Okay. The other change that is happening over over a little bit of time is is the change of the style of apprenticeships, for a better word. We've had what have been known as frameworks up until now. Um, and the early years one has been in, in place for quite some time. Um, I think it was developed by the old Sector Skills Council CWDC when they were in, in uh, when they existed. Um, but going forward, we, we've got a different style of apprenticeships coming on board. And the, the new level three one that was approved, I think in April this year, um, is, a, is an example of that. Um, so that's actually available for delivery currently um, and, and can be funded. So the other thing to I wanted to let you know was that there are what are known as trailblazer groups. They are groups of employers um, who work with one of the department's agencies, the Institute for Apprenticeships and Technical Education, um, to develop new apprenticeships. Um, and there are two trailblazers that are developing a new level two apprenticeship, which will cover all the new criteria that we've just I've just mentioned and the new qualifications. And the, the intention is that they will also be level five and six, which are in development now in sorry, in development currently. Um, I can't tell you exactly when they will be available for delivery. Um, but I would I would imagine sort of within the next year to 18 months, they should be online and available for people to, to deliver, which is really exciting from my point of view, because I think it's really important that we have the progression routes within within the sector that people can uh, follow through with the apprenticeship. So we will, at that point, we'll have a, a level two um, all the way up to a level six, um, which will be really good for the, the sector, I think, personally. There are there's quite a lot of information on the website, uh, on the various websites for about uh, apprenticeships, and there's a specific guide to apprenticeships um, for employers on, on the .gov website, which I've actually put the link onto the slide for you. As I say, the Institute for Apprenticeships has overall responsibility for the new apprenticeships, but I do, in my role um, in workforce, uh, work very closely with them to make sure that we get something that suits the uh, the sector as well. Okay, the, the other thing you, you may have heard about is for, for younger people, um, T-levels uh, have been sort of quite high profile in the, the last couple of weeks because um, they, they were launched and a new website was launched to help young people uh, to know about what what T levels will be, um, and as I say, it's, there's a lot of 
text on that slide, I'm afraid, but I'll, I'll just cover most of it. Um, the two year, it's a two year course or will be a two year course, broadly equivalent to three A levels. Um, but like the apprenticeships we were talking about and the vocational course, they will have both classroom theory and practical learning. Um, and they'll be available for 16 to 19 year olds who've, who've done their GCSEs. Now we're, we're lucky in, in some respects because the earlier sector is one of the new, um, the first to, to develop um, new technical qualifications. Um, and I've been working with, with the with colleagues who were run, who were working on this um, to make sure that it'll be a level three T level that they're developing so that it meets our criteria and will obviously therefore be DFE approved. Um, the other interesting thing is that they will actually um, attract UCAS points. Um, so th there will be some options there for uh, young people who take these to also go into higher education, which is great, I think, from, from our point of view. As I say, there's a whole new website which, which discusses this and will help young people pick it up. Um, so those will be coming online um, shortly and, and there's more information on there. Now, the, the, the one thing that I think most employers uh, and people starting out with their training are interested in is, is how they can fund their training. Um, I don't have responsibility for funding, but I asked my uh, colleagues in the uh, various funding teams to give me some information that might help you to know where to look for further information. Um, the, the key organisation for adult education is the Education and Skills Training Agency. Um, I think it should be funding agency on there, it's my typo. The, there is a legal entitlement for people who are aged between 19 and 23 to full funding of their first level two qualification and also a first level three. So there is funding out there for these qualifications. Um, admittedly, it's, it's aimed at the, um, the younger age range in this case. Um, but there are going to be some changes, um, or there have been some changes, I should say, from the 1st of August in that the adult education budgets are devolved to specified combined authorities, um, and they will actually operate their own funding rules, but they still have to um, have regard for these legal entitlements that I've just explained. Um, for people who are 24 and over, um, or 19 and over if they've already got their first qualification, first level three qualification. There are advanced learner loans available to help that, uh, help people to undertake training and, and qualifications. Uh, and in a similar way to higher education loans, there's a you will start repaying once you, your income is over a certain amount. So a lot of people are not aware of the uh, the learning loans. Um, there are a number of um, study programs available for people aged 16 to 19 um, and that usually combines qualifications and other activities. Now that obviously from uh, going forward will look more like T-level provision so that would be helpful. There also, for people aged over 19, there are some opportunities to get support if, if you qualify um, for things like accommodation and travel and course materials and, and childcare. Um, so those things, again, um, the, the blue writing on this slide is actually link um, into the relevant pieces of our website that will help you with that. And somebody asked a question about uh, maths and English earlier about the level two. Um, there are a lot of um, courses available that are free for um, reading, writing and basic maths, um, which should support a lot of people. Um, and it helps you to study towards your first GCSE equivalent. Okay. Oh, slides have jumped again. Just dealing with that, Ian, one second. Thank you. I'm not sure, is it mine or your end? <laughs> I'm not sure, let's go for it. Yeah, never mind. <laughs> okay, um, and there, there are some uh, organisations that give out grants, grants and bursaries too. Um, 
and usually as it says on the slide you would apply directly to that organization and there's a helpful website called turn to us um, and there's a lot of information on on that uh, site about various grants and things so it's always worth checking on there if, you, if you're a member of staff or if you're an individual who is looking to do a tra some training and qualifications um, actually check see if there might be something on there that you would be eligible for but if you want um, further information on funding for training and qualifications I would suggest quite often your best port of call to start off with is tra local training providers and colleges because they actually know all of this stuff really well um, and because they're, they're dealing with it on a day-to-day -day basis and they can often advise you really well um, on what might be available uh, to your staff or to to you as an individual um, and also on the clearly on the uh, the, the SFA funding um, website through through the .gov.uk contact us page can quite often help too. Okay, I promised that I would mention apprenticeships funding. Um, so the the new style of, of apprenticeships is, is also sort of started at a time when there were uh, was new style of funding for them, um, and the whoops, if you're an employer um, that has a payable of over three million pounds each year you must pay the apprenticeship levy so this is this is how um, apprenticeships are funded going forward those large employers admittedly in the earlier sector there aren't very many of those who would be paying that amount um, but if they do, they they set it, they basically create an account from the money that that they pay into the thing uh, into the levy, and then they can actually use that to to pay for training um, and apprenticeships for their for their staff. If you're not um, a levy paying employer, we've got something um, called co-investment. And basically, that means that um, the government will pay 95% of that training um, for the apprenticeship, up to a maximum um, for that type of training, and the employer contributes 5%. Um, so it's actually it's a very generous co-investment situation there for, for apprenticeships, um, and that, that should help um, make them much more affordable for employers. Yes. I mentioned also that we've got um, a number of graduate qualifications available. Um, one that you may be familiar with is early years initial teacher training, um, which is something the department fully funds um, for those who want to specialise in birth to five education. Just to be re really, really clear on early years teacher status, it is not qualified teacher status so it doesn't qualify somebody to teach in a school um, it specifically was designed for the birth to five age range because it was recognized that that was a specific um, skill set that people needed um, and it's important that people are well trained um, but there are different types of, of degree courses available in early years as well um, for example the early childhood studies degrees are very very popular and um, the early childhood studies um, providers are currently developing new um, practitioner based coures where they they're actually so practice based courses where there will be work placements as well as the, the study side of it and for higher education as I say we we do currently through the department we fund the earliest initial teacher training course anyway but for other courses um, there is higher education student finance available in the majority of cases okay so that that's me covered all the slides so I'm going to hand back and um, take some more questions brilliant thanks Ian Okay, um, so I think one thing I wanted to, we have had some comments through, which I just wanted to kind of confirm with the audience. Um, I'm not going to put these comments uh, uh, directly to Ian, because I think it's a bit unfair to put him on the spot to answer about kind of 
um, some of the larger uh, funding issues around nurseries at the moment. But I want to reassure that some of the comments, the audience, that some of the comments about nurseries' ability to, um, uh, you know, uh, employ above their ratios because of the uh, financial um, concerns and issues that are, that are abundant at the moment, and also um, the, some of the comments about ability to live on a apprenticeship level of pay. What we will do is we will collate these comments and um, send them over at some point. But um, so that's just to reassure the audience that we um, are making a note of your comments regarding that kind of um, in that area, and we will get them over to Ian uh, on and his team. How does that sound, Ian? Is that okay? Yeah, excuse me. Yes, that's fine. Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, as I say, I, it, I don't cover funding, so it would be more difficult. Yes. Yeah. Okay, actually, so some of the questions that were coming through as we moved into your second part of your presentation were still uh, want, want people wanting to clarify uh, regarding apprenticeship and on unqualified staff. So unqualified staff can be used in, in ratios, but apprentices can't. Now, that's, I don't think that's what you're saying, is it, Ian? No, it's not. It's, in effect, if um, if somebody's doing a level two apprenticeship, for example, um, and they don't already have a, 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 a DfE approved qualification of any other type, then they would be in the unqualified part of the ratios. So the ratio is basically going through areas is a level three, a level two, and unqualified, and those are the three parts of the ratio, as it were. Um, so you can still employ, obviously you will already have unemployed uh, an apprentice, but they wouldn't be able to count in the level two or the level three, depending on which is relevant, until they've completed their apprenticeship. Brilliant. Thank you for clarifying. Is it, um, sorry, oh. sorry. <laughs> is it also possible, of course, if somebody's on a level three apprenticeship, they may have already done a level two qualification or apprenticeship, so they might still be able to count in the level two ratios, even while they're working on the level three. Okay. I hope that makes sense. Um, uh, what, this is from Kelly, what's the difference between an apprenticeship and a T-level? <laughs> uh, basically, a, a, basically age range. Um, I think it's sort of, ideally they're gonna be very similar in outcome because they, they'll, they'll be meeting the same criteria. But T levels will be 16 to 19 year olds. Um, and usually uh, people leaving school education would take would take an apprenticeship after that. Yeah. Um, Uh, this is from Kerry. I would like to do an early years teacher qualification, but I moved into a role as an early years advisor. Can I do this without needing to do a placement every week? You would need to be employed um, in a setting, generally speaking, to do it, because a good majority of it would be assessed in the workplace. So that would be, it would be difficult to do it if you're not working in the setting, delivering the EYFS. Okay. Um, you've talked about the new level two standards. Um, this is from Sue Nichols. We're delivering the new level two EY educator standards that have been released. But um, Sue has asked, are there new level two qualifications in development? So I think that uh, the new level two qualifications in development are the ones you've referred to. Yeah, they, yes, absolutely. They, I think what I was saying is that there, we've got some that have already been developed and are on our website as having met the criteria, but awarding organisations are still, some of the other awarding organisations are also developing new ones, so there will be more being added as time goes on that, that meet the same criteria. Brilliant. Okay, um, when can we expect the first T-level students to be actively seeking work in the sector and how will they be counted within the staff ratios? Will the ratios change? Uh, there's, there's no intention of changing the ratios to my knowledge. Um, they will be level three um, qualifications that they come out with. Um, they will be able to count in the ratios at level three. That's the, the intention. 
Oh, and okay. sorry, you asked about the, the timeline. Um, I think they're due to start in 2020. So the guess would be two years from there. Okay, so 2022, we would expect to see those first T-level students coming into the workforce. Yeah. Okay, so just a reminder that this is your opportunity. We do have still have some time if you want to send questions through to Ian. Um, a couple of questions are coming through, I think, as we speak. Um, this is about the... Um, Early years teacher status, you pointed out it's not qualified teacher status, mm -hmm. but are there any plans for EYTS to be brought in line with QTS? At the moment, they are not equal. Not to my knowledge. No. No. Okay, I'm just, uh, my colleague is, is quickly describing some questions for me. Will higher level apprenticeship funding pay the university fees? That's from Fiona Kong. Will higher level apprenticeship funding pay the university fees? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I would imagine that is part of the funding regime for that, but it's, I'm afraid it's not my area. Um, it would probably be better to direct that question to the Institute for Apprenticeships. They will be able to tell you that. Okay, Fiona, um, and I think you gave something about that in your slides, didn't you? And those slides will be available. Yes, yeah, um, absolutely. There used to be a funded, this is from uh, James Wallace, there used to be a funded level four vocational qualification, which was a great next step for those with a level three who didn't want to go to uni. It was dropped a few years ago. Are there any plans for it to be replaced? I'm not familiar with there uh, having been, a, I don't know who would have funded it, but um, I'm afraid that was probably before my time. It's, it's certainly <laughs> my time has never been funded at level four. Um, I mean, there are some foundation degrees still available that cover the level four or five aspect. Um, and I would imagine that that would be able to be funded through a, an advanced loan in some cases, if you're eligible. Um, sorry, I, I can't really help much more on that one. <laughs> okay, no problem. Um, and of course, I like that we, I said um, earlier, some of these are quite technical. So um, I hope uh, I hope some of these make, make sense to you, might, might not necessarily make sense to me. But um, is the new level two early years practitioner qualification suitable for a work-based learner as well as an apprenticeship? That's from Vicky. Absolutely, yes it is. Um, the qualifications really are designed to be vocational, they're work-based. Okay, and Paula would like to know, well she's pointing out that there are different, still different qualifications that are accepted in England and Wales and she's, she's kind of querying why really. Yeah, <laughs> um, it's basically I think currently because uh, we have devolved administrations now and they, they clearly can set their own requirements. You, you probably um, thinking back to the time when we we all had exactly the same qualifications. We do have arrangements to accept um, qualifications from the devolved administrations though, so it shouldn't be too much of a problem. Okay. Um. So, so the second so the second part of that question has just come through. We have recruited a member of staff who is qualified to work in a setting one mile away. I presume this is Paula, I presume Paula is working close to a border, but is not class as fully level three qualified in our setting without completing additional units. So that's why that question has come about. All right, I'm guessing that's probably a Scotland border question. Mm -hmm. um, Yes, that is the case, and that's because the, the, the qualification itself oh. didn't cover um, all of our criteria. I am currently working with the, my colleagues in the devolved administrations to look at this going forward. Um, so I'm okay. hoping that we'll be able to make it easier for people, because we're aware yeah. that some providers you know, do cross borders, absolutely. Yeah, it was actually um, a Wales border. Oh, is it Wales? Oh, that's interesting. Does the same apply? Yeah, it would be. Yes, it would be the same. Okay. 
Okay, um, we've got a, uh, so somebody here who pointed out that the 2012 Nut Brown Review recommended that by 2022 all staff counting in staff child ratio should have minimum level three. Are there plans to walk, to move towards this, Ian? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I think you'd have to ask the ministers that. Um, yeah. <laughs> to be fair, uh, it wasn't, as far as I'm aware, it, it was one of the, one of the things that wasn't accepted in the Nut Brown review. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, we've we've got, I, you know, it's the last stats I've seen, I think, was something like 80% level three qualified. Um, so I suppose it. Yeah. It, by almost by default, we're get, we're going that direction. It seems right. Okay. Um, from Vicky, what paediatric first aid qualifications are deemed full and relevant for new EYE standard? The if you, if you have a look at the details in the EYFS, there are some some more details in the footnotes that tell you the type of qualifications that are suitable for that. Um, that's probably the best answer I can give, so that at least you've, you know, you've got it in, in writing there. Um, I can't remember which page it's on, but um, as I say, there is a, if you search through it on um, PFA, it'll come up with the, the right uh, requirements. Okay. Right, we are um, probably coming to an end. The questions are slowing down. There is one, again, a technical one, so, so if we manage to answer this, then we'll have done really well. I think we'll have, I think we'll have answered everybody's questions that came in in that flurry. Um, can I clarify, um, and there's, she's pointing, she's, uh, Kathy has put the, the point uh, 3.31, 3.32. So the, the repeated bullet in each state at least one member of staff must hold a full and relevant level three qualification. Is this actually referring to the same individual that has to have a level three, not a separate individual for each age range of under two, two-year-olds and three-year-olds plus? So I think that's the, state, the same statement that's put under the staff ratios under each point, but she's just clarifying whether that's the same um, level three um, under each of those age ranges. Right, I, yes, I, th I think I see what she's saying. I think if you were having a mixed, I think the question is, if you were having a mixed age range, would you need a level three for each of those ages? And the answer is no, I think you would need one level three manager across it. Okay, Kathy, I hope that has answered your question. Right, I think, um, Yep, so just last the question three is just kind of whether we're going to be sending out the PowerPoint and that type of thing. And yes, we will be. The PowerPoint will be available. Um, and this whole recording will be available within the next couple of days. So, um, Ian, I think uh, we, sh we shot loads of really technical questions at you. I I'm sorry about that, but it's clearly what the, um, the workforce needed. Indeed, so, yeah, that's thank great. You. That's great. And really good, really good opportunity to be able to have, you know, the workforce ask the man himself, the person, the person who knows yeah. directly. So yeah. um, that's been really brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Welcome. Okay, Ian. Well, like I say, thank you so much. That's been really positive. And um, I'm going to move move on now to just a brief roundup um, of some things regarding the future um, of the uh, foundation years. What people can expect. But, um, thanks once again, and we'll we'll catch up soon, Ian. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Okay. So um, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, I think there may be some questions that have come through in the last minute or two. And like I said earlier, what we will try to do is, if there are themes or questions that haven't been answered. We will try to do a roundup, as well as those comments that have come through regarding funding. We'll try to do a roundup and an overview, and we'll get it over to Ian and the um, DFE team. Um, so, yeah, I hope you enjoyed that opportunity to fire your fire your questions to Ian and hear about um, apprenticeship, P levels, um, the the new level two criteria, and also lots of clarification required regarding ratios, which is, um, I'm really pleased we've been able to, 
to confirm that for you. Okay, so I just wanted to let you know a few things that are coming up through um, the foundation years. Uh, we will have uh, we will have further webinars, um, and we will definitely have one webinar taking place before Christmas, and this will be around the EYFS consultation, and DFE will be will be leading that webinar. We're also looking forward to hosting um, in partnership with the Department for Education um, some further Learn Explore debate events. They will be nationwide from January 2020. Um, you'll find details available via the website. Um, uh, we're just confirming those, those um, dates and venues now, but there will be um, five events nationally for you to come along and hear directly from the Department for Education. We also have um, three events taking place in Cornwall uh, in March next year. Um, and NCB are working with the Early Years Alliance, pre previously the Preschool Learning Alliance, on those events, and we will um, give information via the Foundation Years website. If you haven't visited the Foundation Years website any time recently, please do go and have a look. Um, it has been refreshed. We hope that it's more accessible and that the up-to-date information you require is more easily found on the website now, so please do go along and have a look. Um, also, um, if you're not already signed up, our monthly Foundation News newsletters will give you relevant research and policy direct to your inbox. So just a final word, once again, thank you for your time and contribution. Thanks so much to Ian for his time. We really appreciate that. I hope you have found it useful. Um, the questions that came through were, were relevant and the audience participation is what really makes the webinar, so thanks again. You've got the link to the Foundation Years website there if you want to join to the um, mailing list. Um, and that will be where you find any details of upcoming webinars and events. You also have an email address there for my colleagues who you can field questions or comments to. We will um, be sending out via an email um, an evaluation form for this uh, webinar. So please do return that. Your um, thoughts and your views are really important to us. So I just um, hope you all have a great evening. Thanks once again for being part of the webinar. I hope you found it useful. Many thanks and good night. <laughs>